I'm making a video here. My name's Jeremiah Mills, and it's going to be about wolves, sharks, and blood. Now, if you were to start bleeding in the in the ocean, and there's sharks nearby, I've heard that they can sense blood from far away. Now, if you're a stranger, a widow, the fatherless, or poor, and you need help, the wolves and the sharks can sense that from a mile away. You walk into their church building, which is a place of false doctrine, a place that does not teach truth. That's Church buildings can't teach truth. They're incommensurable. That means there's no standard of measure with that and believers. They are mutually exclusive. That's another way of saying incommensurable. They're just two completely separate things. So just by the virtue of walking into one of these places, that's like having a open wound. An open wound. If you've ever seen a documentary on the Komodo dragon, what they do is they'll bite their prey and then that bite will get infected and they'll stalk it for days until it begins to get game green and start dying. And then the Komodo dragons will eat it. So this is like walking into a shark or being in shark infested waters or being in a being bleeding out with a pack of wolves nearby. Now they're going to eat you if, if that happens. So by going into a church they already understand that you're searching. Searching, right? They know now that you're looking for something. So rather than helping you They smell the blood, they smell the, the wound, and it starts making them hungry, right? They may look like this, like, hi buddy, welcome to the church, we're glad to see you, come on in, right? They all smiles. What that is, is short cons. Because if you don't figure, if you figure, if you do figure this out real quick, it's just going to be a short con because you're going to understand that they're just there to make money off of you. And like like I said, you walk in there and they smell blood. And then they have long cons. That's those people who have sat in a church for 30 years, 30 to like 60 years, right? They've been in some church for that long. Just sitting in a pew. So they, they know this. That's how they get their business. They know that people are coming in there. They know that people are coming in there and they need help. That's why people come to Jesus, right? They need help. They're broken. They have no other place to turn. No place to turn, right? So they're coming to the, they're coming to the church, right? So what they do is they go to church. Go ahead and Google that phrase or go to Blue Letter Bible and search for that. That's not even a, a phrase. So what I want to share with y'all, I want to read with y'all something slowly so y'all can get the gist of this. This is from a book, History of the Christian Church, The Antinocene Christianity by Philip Shea. And anti nicene Christianity he has on here A.D. 100 to 325. So, what we're going to read about is we're going to read about... <coughs> well, I'm going to read it to you. Here we go. The idea and institution of a special priesthood distinct from the body of the people with the accompanying notion of sacrifice and altar 
passed imperceptibly from Jewish and heathen reminiscence, reminiscences and analogies into the Christian church. Bingo. And the title of this is Clergy and Laity. So you have the Jewish traditions and then you have the Gentile and Gentile means heathen, the heathen traditions, tradition, and along with that comes their culture, their way of life. So he just told you, he said, the idea and institution of a special priesthood distinct from the body of the people with the accompanying notion of sacrifice and altar passed imperceptibly from Jewish and heathen reminiscences and analogies into the Christian church. This is important. This is important to understand. Two of the most little known things that are so important, beginning with Adam and Eve, and then going from Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and then the, the Jewish traditions and rituals, so two of the most important of understanding when Jesus makes it on the scene is first, first and foremost, the Old Testament. Most people don't know anything about the Old Testament. That's the very seed that the New Testament blossoms out of. That's why when you buy a Bible, it's there. Um, so, um, and then you have the heathens which is what the Gentiles are, and all of their customs and cultures, and that would be the Greeks and Romans. You have to know something about the Greek and Romans to understand what was happening with Jesus made it on the scene. The Greeks, Romans, the Jews, and you have to understand how that corrupted the early church. Now what we're talking about right now is what people will call the primitive, primitive church. But it wasn't a church. Church is a new word that no one was going by back then. The, the term in the scriptures is ekklesia. The ekklesia, ek means out. And kaleo, which is where that kalaseya there comes from, means called. Called out. Now, if you look in a, in a word book, like the, um, the Dictionary of Latin and Greek Origins, it will tell you that claimed means called out. So, those claimed by God, trust in God, and lean not on your own, own understanding. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, these Jewish and heathen customs, they, the people didn't want to let them go, and they trickled into the primitive church, primitive Christianity, right? But when we say church, we're not talking about a building, we're talking about what the scriptures say with the ecclesia, the called out, those claimed by God, because we're one unit, we're one entity, one building, one plant, one body, with Christ as the head. So it goes on to say, <clears throat> the majority of Jewish converts adhere tenaciously to the Mosaic institutions and rites. Jewish rites and rituals, and a considerable part never fully attained to the height of spiritual freedom proclaimed by Paul, or soon fell away from it. He opposed legalistic and ceremonial tendencies in Galatia and Corinth. So he opposed legalism. We're going we're gonna to write liturgy. This is what the world right now calls liturgy. The laws the church makes and the ceremonies they observe. Ceremony. 
That's what they also call the liturgy is what they're talking about when they say worship service. Worship service. What they mean when they say worship service is liturgy. And that is their law and ceremony. That's what they do when they say come in at 7 o'clock or 10.30. Two, we have one at 7.30, one at 10.30 on a Sunday. They observe times, they observe laws, they observe cer ceremonies, they observe worship servants and liturgy. <clears throat> so, Paul opposed that. And although sacerdotalism, the priests, the philosophy of the priests, does not appear among the errors of the Judaizing opponents, the Levitical priesthood, with its three ranks of high priest, priest, and Levite, naturally furnished an analogy for the threefold ministry of bishop, priest, and deacon. So that's important. What they just did is they just showed you a comparison. They showed you the comparison between high priest, high priest, and I'm going to leave a space here because I'm going to write something else, priest, and Levite. So they said that made for a good analogy for the Jews, the Judaizing ones, to compare that to the bishop, the priest, and the deacon. Now remember, in the early church, there was no hierarchy in the primitive church. It's like Luther said, priesthood of all believers. Even the Montanists liked Tertullian, and Tertullian, some people say Tertullian was a Montanist, at least in the later part of his life, because... He saw how corrupt the church was and was becoming. He said, <clears throat> he said it as well because he understood this. The scriptures make it plain. Revelations 1, kings and priests washing the blood of Jesus. Revelations 5, kings and priests washing the blood. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says that we've been made a royal priesthood, a kingly priesthood. And in it, I believe it's Exodus 19 where it says, you are a nation of priests are a kingdom of priests. So you see that analogy there that he made, high priest, bishop, priest, priest, Le Levite, and deacon, which did not give people grounds to come in and start a false hierarchical system when the scriptures make it plain it's all believers who are priests. So he says, and came to be regarded as typical of it, as that analogy there, those connections. Still, less could the Gentile Christians as a body at once emancipate themselves from their traditional notions of priesthood, altar, and sacrifice on which their former religion was based. So the Gentiles, the heathens, they had a priesthood, priesthood, an altar, and sacrifice. Sacrifice. So those things weren't just going away. The, the, the Jews didn't want to let go of their rituals. And the heathens didn't want to let go of their rituals. The Gentiles weren't letting go of their rituals. So they're like, hey, we'll just mix Jesus into it. And that's called syncretism. Syncretism and ecumenism. Ecumenism. Sorry if I spelled that wrong. I was just writing it quick. So ecumenism. Syncretism. Now tell me this, how are you going to harmonize, harmonize these things? And they did, right? And they still do to this day, harmonize. When you harmonize, you say like, ah, and then someone else is going, ah, right? The same thing. No, you say, what? That's completely wrong. Get that out of here. I'm not listening to that. That's why the scripture calls it rebuke, exhort, call near, rebuke, make manifest. Whatever is light makes manifest, right? So you rebuke, and when people are in error, the scripture teaches you to call them out. Get that out of your assembly. <clears throat> so he goes on to say, Whether we regard the change as an apostasy from a higher position attained, 
or as a reaction of old ideas never fully abandoned, the change is undeniable and can be traced to the second century. Well, John lived all the way to the 96 AD, they say, when he was writing on the island of Patmos. So, it's important to understand what you mean when you say first, second, and third century. First century is zero to one hundred. Second century is one hundred to two hundred. Third century is two hundred to three hundred. So he says the real bad corruption of the Judaism and the the, the Jewish rituals and the liturgy and the the Gentile overthrow of the primitive church can be traced to the second century. And they harmonized. That's why you have Christmas and Easter and the Tooth Fairy and St. Valentine and Cupid and Leprechauns and St. Patrick's Day. All of that. Memorial's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, honor the troop, honor the president, honor... Israel, honor to Chinese, honor Russia, right? Anything goes. Just honor everybody. Like, everybody ecumenize, synchronize your beliefs. Don't call anybody out for anything. So I'm going to read that one more time. He says, Whether we regard the change as an apostasy from a higher position attained, the primitive church, and they apostatize, or as a reaction of old ideas never fully abandoned. They never let go of the Jewish rituals and ceremonies. They never let go of the Gentile rituals and ceremonies. The change is undeniable. <laughs> it happens. They, what Paul and James and all of those early believers were talking about, Paul, James, John, Peter, all of those guys... Completely abandoned. Jesus. There, no one even listens to anything remotely what Jesus said anymore. They follow what the world says. They follow them. They look to them as kings and princes and priests, right? They don't listen to Jesus. That's their prince. That's why I always tell people to get the book, The Prince, by Niccolo Machiavelli. M Machiavelli. And to get the book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, by Carol Quigley. Because... That will help your eyes illuminate to how the world feels about rulership and principalities. The church could not long occupy the ideal height of the apostolic age. They fall, fell from grace. They fell from what the apostles were talking about with Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. And as the Pentecostal illumination passed away with the death of the apostles... The old reminiscences began to reassert themselves, Jewish and Gentile rituals and ceremonial law. Ba Adam and Eve, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, the, the sects of the Stoics and the Epicureans, all of these people began to just take over Christianity. That's what you see today. So it wasn't Christianity, it just became paganism again. So, um, that's what he says right there. Old reminiscences began to reassert themselves. Now there's a note here, in the, a footnote that's very important too. It says, Renan, looking at the gradual development of the hierarchy out of the primitive democracy, from his secular point of view, this is a secular guy noticing this. He says, calls it the most profound transformation in history and a triple abdication. First, the club, the congregation, committing its power to the bureau. The bureau are the committee. So they went from a congregation and then they relinquished the power to a committee, a few guys, right? The college of presbyters. <laughs> the college. The tradition, right? Jesus said, like, you follow the tradition of the elders. The tradition of the, the older people, right? So that's what it's saying. A group of guys said, hey, we're in charge of the church now. And they say, okay, well, you, you take the power. It goes on to say, 
Then the Bureau, or the, and that became the college, right? Those guys, the important guys, said, hey, well, we're educated, we're important. Um, I went through college, and now I'm in charge of you guys. And everyone's like, oh, okay, well, whatever. The Bureau, to its president, so then the Bureau, now that there's a committee, and the college learned aristocrats, right? They say, okay, well, we're going to make the president in charge. So he's in charge now. And they call that the bishop. And that's not a scriptural version of a bishop. That's just what the world calls a bishop. And he says, who could say? Jesus le club. And finally, the presidents to the pope. So all the presidents gave their power to the Pope and each one of the different congregations that were spread across the world. And they gave it to the Pope. As the universal and infallible bishop, the last process being completed in the Vatican Council of 1870. The Vatican Council of the 1870 was when the priesthood of all believers went to a bureau to this educated presbyters the College of the Presbyters, and then they said, well, hey, we're going to make this guy in charge, the president and the bishop. Well, you had a bunch of these in the beginning, a bunch of assemblies, and they, they did the same thing, went to a committee, and then they gave it away to the president. And then all of these different people who were scattered out, they gave all of their power to this man called the Pope. So it's a complete apostasy. The church... The Ecclesia is just completely apostatized. It's, it's gone. <laughs> I mean, it's scattered. There's, there's people here and there who still believe. But if there ever was a true group of believers, a, a true Ecclesia, when Paul and James and Peter and John were around, that has completely apostatized itself. I, I just would say to the world... If there was anything I could say, just prepare yourself for what's about to come upon the earth. Just get ready for what's going to happen when all of these Baptists, Pentecostals, Church of Christ, and all them start holding hands with the Pope, and then the Pope starts to issue the orders and everything. I don't know if that's how it's going to happen, but just looking at these, this information makes it look that way. So he goes on to say, <clears throat> In the apostolic church, preaching and teaching were not confined to a particular class. To a particular class. There was no high person up here who was the preacher. Every single person is supposed to be the preacher. That's what the scripture teaches. Every single person is supposed to preach, teach, and share as they go out into the world on a day-to-day -day basis. But every convert could proclaim the gospel to unbelievers. And they still can. That's what we're supposed to do. And every Christian who had the gift could pray and teach and exhort in the congregation. The New Testament knows no spiritual aristocracy or nobility. There you go. The New Testament knows no spiritual aristocracy or nobility. There's no educated elite. That's the... Aristo means best, and that's the educated. And then, and civilization, civilization means, if you look up the definition, higher culture. That's what civilization means, is a higher culture. So you have the educated aristocrats, and then it says, or nobility. The New Testament knows no spiritual Educated elite or nobility. Princes. The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. He has some good things to say in there. No, okay, not good in the Christian sense, but just to show you the way they think, man. It's completely wicked. It's, it's insane. The, so he goes on to say that, but calls all believers saints. All believers are saints. Though many fell far short of their vocation, nor does it recognize a special priesthood in distinction from the people. There was no clergy and laity. There was no pulpit 
in Pew. The one place where it says pulpit in Nehemiah 8, there was 14 people standing on a wooden platform. 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Now that's going to be one crazy lectern, the thing that they call a pulpit today. That's not what it is. In the scripture, it's a a meg doll. Looks kind of like a cursive G. Mem. Meg. So then it would be the G. It's kind of like a foot, kind of like that. I can't draw these things perfect, but I'm learning how to get a little better at drawing them anyways. Meg. Meg. Doll. So then it would be a, a dollid. A dollid. And then the, the shepherd's hook. So anyways, I'm, I'm learning how to do that a little better. Sorry if I'm, I'm certainly not an expert by any means. So um, a McDowell is the, the tower. It means a tower. Ezra in Nehemiah chapter 8 was standing on a tower. A wooden platform, not a pulpit as we know it today. So, he goes on to say... <clears throat> Let's see, he says, Nor does it recognize a special priesthood and distinction from the people as mediating between God and the laity. It didn't exist. It knows only one high priest, Jesus Christ, the, the bishop and shepherd of our faith, right? And clearly teaches the universal priesthood as well as universal kingship of believers. Universal priesthood, universal kingship. Kings and priests, Revelation chapter 1. Kings and priests, Revelation chapter 5. Royal priesthood, meaning the kingly priesthood, 1 Peter chapter 2. And then in Hebrews chapters, I believe, 5, 6, 7, and 8. It might be 6, 7, 8, and 9. All talk about Melchizedek. And that means king of righteousness, priest of Salem. It's Melchi and Zedek. And it, the Sadducees got their name from Zedek, the Zadduxes, right? Zadok, Zadduxes. And Melchi, so king of righteousness, priest of Salem. The scripture says, our, um, king of righteousness, priest of Salem. It might be priest of righteousness, king of Salem. Sorry about that. But that's still talking about the same thing. When the scripture speaks of kings and priests, it's speaking of us. The Melchizedek priesthood. Christ is the head. We are the body. We are the continuance of the Melchizedek priesthood. Adam, Seth, Enos. Canaan, Mahalalil, um, e Enoch, Melchizedek, or I'm sorry, um, Methuselah, then Lamech, Noah, and then you just go all the way down, right, till you get to Jesus from the believers, the living stones, the ones who had faith, as it says in Hebrews 11. So he goes on here and he says, as well as a, as universal kingship of believers, it do, does it does this in a far deeper and larger sense than the old, in a sense too, which even to this day is not yet fully recognized. But even in Exodus 19, I believe it was, it says that you are a kingdom of priests. Speaking of Israel, and we're spiritual Israel. A Jew is not one outwardly, but is a Jew of the heart. In a sense, too, which even to this day is not fully realized, the entire body of Christians are called clergy, cleroi, a peculiar people, the heritage of God. <clears throat> On the other hand, it is equally clear that there was in the apostolic church a ministerial office instituted by Christ for the very purpose of raising the mass of believers from infancy and pupillage to independent and immediate intercourse with God. That, that makes sense. 
And you should con conduct yourself as such to help other believers come to the recognition that they are directly answerable to God. There's no man who mediates between another man and God. To that prophetic, priestly, and kingly position, which in principle and destination belongs to them all. So I'm going to read that one more time. He says, on the other hand, it is equally clear that there was in the apostolic church a ministerial office instituted by Christ for the very purpose of raising the mass of believers from infancy and pupillage to the independent and immediate intercourse with God, to the prophetic, priestly, and kingly position, which in principle and destination belongs to them all. Amen. This work is the gradual process of church history itself, and will not be fully accomplished till the kingdom of glory shall come. But these ministers are nowhere represented as priests in any other sense than Christians, generally are priests with the privilege of a direct access to the throne of grace in the name of their one and eternal high priest in heaven. Even in the pastoral epistles, which present the most advanced stage of ecclesiastical organization in the apostolic period, while the teaching, ruling, and pastoral functions of the presbyter slash bishops are fully discussed, nothing is said about a priestly function, a sacerdotal function. The Apocalypse, which was written still later, emphatically teaches the universal priesthood and kingship of believers. The apostles themselves never claim or exercise a special priesthood. The sacrifice which all Christians are exhorted to offer is the sacrifice of their person and property to the Lord and the spiritual sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. In one passage, a Christian altar is spoken of in distinction distinction from the Jewish altar of literal and daily sacrifices. But this altar is the cross on which Christ offered himself once and forever for the sins of the world. Now, I just found that last night. <laughs> I was like, wow. Again, that was History of the Christian Church, Volume 2, Anti-Nicene Christianity, A.D. 100 to 325. And... It's by Philip Schaeff. That is a great passage right there. It was under the entry, clergy and laity. Let me get that for you real quick. It is entry 42. I like how they do that. They put a little number there so you can find it. So 42. Okay. So I'm going to leave y'all with that. And I'm just going to say, if you watch my videos... It's amazing when you stumble upon something like that because from reading scripture, I began to understand the things that I was saying there. Now, to help y'all, I would really like y'all to write some of this stuff I just discussed with y'all down. Or I'd like for y'all to take some intricate notes on the things we just discussed here. Beginning from the beginning to the end. And I feel that you will be way, way further absorbed into the importance of understanding that you are answerable to Christ and never to a man. So I hope that this helps and I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Bye.